92.1 WRU Dayton's R&B leader. We are in the middle of an amazing discussion. It is the day of discussion that we're having here on our radio station and across Alpha Media stations all over the nation. It is a time for a conversation that may be difficult for some, that may be uncomfortable for others, but is long overdue. We've talked to several people today from a national standpoint and a national platform, but I am joined now by Dr. Derek L. Forward of the Dayton Unit of the NAACP. Thank you so much for joining us today. Hey, thank you, Faith, for having me. Uh, it's always good to see you, always good to talk with you and uh, just be in your presence, whether or not it's in person or whether or not it's like this. Well, I absolutely love it that we have an opportunity to talk at this time because the NAACP has been very busy working through what we see, what we are feeling, and how we're processing that. And the important thing for us to do is know we can march, we can sing, we can pray, we can go to memorials, we can do rallies, but until we have a strategic plan that will allow us to move forward, once all those are complete, we're going to be right back in the same boat we were in. Is that correct? Uh, you're absolutely correct with that. Uh, now, I'll tell you what, uh, you know, I participated in two different marches over the past weekend uh, when all of this stuff broke loose. But first of all, let me just say on behalf of the Dayton unit uh, of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, uh, I want to take this opportunity to say uh, that we send our condolences to the family of uh, George Floyd, as well as any other African-American who has lost their life uh, at the hands of a police officer. So, uh, so we want to make certain that they know that we are here for them, we care about them, and we're constantly praying for them. So uh, now getting back to your question, uh, I want to tell you, uh, over the past weekend or so, uh, we participated, or I participated in two different um, uh, marches. One was a march, one was a sit-in. Uh, but in both instances, uh, we spoke with our youth out there, and, you know, this is their moment in our, you know. Yes, yes. Is, you know, this is a time that we're seeing them in action, just like Martin Luther King, just like Jesus, both in their thirties when they died. Uh, you know, so this is, you know, th this is their moment. Uh, and uh, so as I think about that, I want them though to understand that as they march, as they protest, as they do their sit-ins, uh, you know, as they uh, participate, you know, inside of, uh, you know, or having their constitutional rights mm -hmm. and the first amendment, uh, what I want them to really understand is I want them to use that same level of energy. Yep. To ensure that they get out there and vote on November 3rd and beyond. Uh, you know, that's what's going to tell the tale. That's how laws get changed. Laws, we need to worry about the laws that's on the books and how we're going to change those laws that's on the books. I can tell you that we had we were very successful at registering a quite a number of people uh, at those events in Troutwood, Ohio, and also in Huber Heights, Ohio. Uh, so we were very successful, but I can tell you there are people out there. I had to convince a man, and uh, that he needed to vote in every single election, yeah. general elections that's coming up. I'm talking about midterm elections, but I'm also talking about special elections. And that's we right. understand that politics is local; that you need to be voting inside of your uh, city council races, your judicial races. Oftentimes, our young folks don't understand. A lot of people, a lot of African Americans who are incarcerated, there's somebody who sentenced those individuals. That is correct. Or, uh, you know, to long, long uh, prison sentences. But what they need to understand is they need to study who is running for judge, mm -hmm. and how, what, what kind of record as relates to the African American community, and they need to vote for the judges. You know that they feel uh, that's going to treat them with equity and equality and justice when it comes to being sentenced. So uh, when, you know, that's what I want people to focus on is yeah. their right to vote. Uh, you know, it, you know, it's all right to march and protest. You know, I don't have anything against it. And, and a matter of fact, I applaud, uh, you know, the individuals. I mean, this is their Emmett Till moment. That's right. Emmett Till. This is their Emmett Till moment. You know, so, um, so my thing is, I want to make certain that our folks are educated, our young people are educated, our middle-aged people are educated to know that voting is what 
is what's going to really matter. At That's the right. That's right. And you you hit on a very, very interesting point is that when we talk about who you're voting for, you have to also consider the prosecutors. You have to also consider the judges. You have to consider the whole spectrum of the judicial system because every single one of those people play a part in how African-Americans are sentenced and how harshly they're sentenced in comparison to any other race for the same crimes. That's absolutely correct. And then when people such as the organizations such as the NAACP, we have our candidates night, uh, you know, we encourage everybody all across this nation, when it's time to have candidates night, don't just look on Facebook for the marching and protest, but yeah. look for, uh, you know, on Facebook and on Twitter and on Instagram for candidates nights. So you can hear what these candidates are actually saying and you can ask the tough questions of those candidates and you can spread the message of, hey, don't vote for this person. This person is saying this. Don't vote for that person. That person is saying that. Or you need to vote for this person because this person has a true vested interest in right. my opinion as an American citizen. And in an invested interest in the community and mm -hmm. literally serving the community. That's right. And we have lost our way where that's concerned. Uh, when you said you had to convince the gentleman to vote, that is a pain. I had to convince him to get registered. He told me, so let me go back to that. Yeah, th that was very interesting because um, your lady came up to our table and uh, and she was like, you, know, you see that gentleman over there? I said, we're at. So she pointed the guy out. He said, he told me that he don't vote, but look at him. He on the front line out there. He would he he has the biggest sign out there. Mm -hmm. said, well, he said he don't vote. He, she said, yeah. So uh, I went to the front of the line. And yeah. Went and talked to the young man, and uh, I think he just got tired of me. So finally, he said, "Okay, well, well I'll come over there. I'll, you know, I register." So he came over to the table. Uh, he filled the registration form out. And then he went on back to his family because he, he had a beautiful wife and beautiful kids and, uh, and, and you know, teaching them, uh, you know, how, you know, what democracy looks like. I right. That's what he was doing. And uh, so I'll probably say within, I don't know, maybe a half hour, 45 minutes had passed. He came over to me and said, sir, can I talk to you for a minute? I said, sure. He said, sir, I got to be a man. I need to man up. And I need to apologize to you. I said, apologize to me for what? Wow. He said, I wrote the wrong information because I told you I never voted. My wife been trying to get me to vote. People have just been trying. I mean, my wife been trying to get me to register. Uh, people have been trying to get me to register. And I, don't, I just don't believe in voting. So I, don't, I didn't want to register. But you know what? Everything you said to me was absolutely right. I want to man. And I want to do the right thing. Do the right thing. For real. And I said, man, you know, no worries, my brother. I said, it, it happens. Yeah, yeah. You, but what I told that young man, I said, you have the ability to have a true impact because every single person who was lined up and down uh, that street right there mm -hmm. on two in Huber Heights, Ohio, each one of those individuals has their own circles of influence uh, that they could impact a lot of people. They could have influence and have those individuals to register to vote and to get out there and exercise their right to vote. And let's say that they want to put some on the ballot that they feel uh, is important. Uh, you know, uh, and that's what our young folks need to understand too. There are also ballot initiatives. Yes. Something. And and learn about them. Read that's up right. on them. Educate yourself. And for people like you who are standing in the gap of for the generations that have been lost, we we have we've have we have failed them somewhere to mm -hmm. they think it does not matter. I don't matter. I don't count. And it is going to be up to us to re-educate them. Yes, you do matter. Your voice right. must be heard. In addition to that, you must take pride in the community in which you live and so back into that community with mentorship, with young people, with community relationships. And that's what the NAACP is all about. Uh, yes, I, you know, every single month in a Dayton community, <laughs> uh, we're holding some type of educational forum. So all the different issues that we have heard people complain about, uh, you know, over the years of time, what we do is each one of our committee chairs, uh, whether or not it's our education chair, criminal justice chair, health chair, 
uh, political action chair. Uh, all of our chairs are basically tasked uh, coming up uh, with their own topic, uh, coming up with their own guest panelists, and having an open discussion that's open to the public. Uh, and the topics that we have and uh, in, in, in have had regarding criminal justice and, uh, and civic engagement has actually been some very good topics. And our meetings are well attended, but they're not well attended by our young folks. That's correct. Make certain that our young folks get in there and get the information. We need to make sure our young folks are engaged with us. Yes. Uh, and our young folks need to understand that we need them. Absolutely, you know, absolutely. Like, you know, we have a young adult committee, many, uh, you know, that we have a chair of our young adult committee. We would like to get them engaged with our young adult committee. Uh, you know, become the change that you want to see. That's right. And the level of energy you and and the way they say that, way the young people say it, keep that same energy. The way we watch them march over the last fourteen days. Imagine harnessing, bottling that energy for the positive level of the cause, for the strategic planning and execution of the cause, for the um, engagement and relationship building in the cause, we have got to do exactly what a number of people across this platform have said. We've got to bring them to the table. We've, we've got to bring them to the table and we can't criticize the way they come to the table. We've got to get them there. They have gifts and talents that can be helpful in the protest, but also gifts and talents that are going to be helpful for the future of this ongoing protest because it can't be two months from now and we are business as usual. We can't. We cannot. Everybody yeah, has a part right. to play. Everybody has a part to play and engaging our young people in a very positive way in order to allow them to take the lead. But as elders, support that, support their, their projects, support their hosting of um, town halls that will reach their peers. These are things that I know that we as a community can put our arms around and put our hearts around for our young people. And we've laid the groundwork. We've been marching since the 60s. They know how to do that. They learned. They, yeah. They've seen it. That's right. They know how to do it. They've done it. <laughs> they came and they did their thing. Now right. we have to show them the execution plans of how to change legislation and how to change um, policies within certain departments that don't go in their favor. These are things that we have to bring them to the table for. And the NAACP has done a fantastic job with creating some some requirements, some demands, and we would love for you to share with us about those. Okay, so so you're speaking of the demands that uh, that we are engaging every law enforcement agency inside Montgomery County, Ohio, uh, to uh, that we expect for them to follow uh, to make Montgomery County, Ohio. As a matter of fact, I just met with the mayors and managers just a little while ago. And uh, it was a very good, engaging conversation. And it seems like they're very well receptive uh, of this eight point strategy that we put together for uh, law enforcement agencies in Montgomery County. And what I told them is that I feel that we can be a model, Montgomery County, Ohio. Yes. So for uh, all law enforcement agencies across this great book, I say, Ohio, and all across the spectrum. That's of right. The United States of America. Uh, if we follow by these eight requirements, uh, you know, and it's simply this, modify uh, and or implement a citizens review board, uh, empowered with subpoena powers. That's very critical. There mm -hmm. are of uh, citizen review boards or civilian review boards or, 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 you know, it's called different things in different uh, local municipalities, but whatever the name of their citizen re review board, it may be called, it needs to have subpoena powers. And then also, you know, basically to investigate complaints by members of the public concerning misconduct by police officers. This review should be a diverse independent agency elected by the citizens through an electoral process such as precinct captains and will conduct parallel investigations to consider alongside the internal affairs investigations by the police department. Uh, we feel that that bullet point number one uh, with uh, 
with a civilian review board with subpoena powers and elected by the people, uh, not appointed by city um, uh, city managers, not appointed by right, right, or the trustee board. Let it be an electoral process. Let people run for that, those positions, just like we run for everything else. That's right. And then let the citizens be able to uh, investigate a case, thoroughly investigate a case, uh, to see whether or not what they come up with versus what the police come up with. That's right. It must have subpoena powers. And then we got to say, well, who's going to give them those subpoena powers? Uh, we will hope that a judge would step into place in that particular case and give this, this newfound citizens review board or civilian review board, however you name it, mm -hmm. powers uh, that will be enforced through the courts. Uh, number two, uh, create a more transparent process around the accountability of officers who violate citizens' constitutional rights, uh, the canons of police ethics, and departmental policies and procedures by making their names and disciplinary records available to the public. Uh, oftentimes, uh, their records are not made available to the public. That is correct. That and is then correct. you never hear about, you know, such as the officer who had the knee on George Floyd's neck 18 times. 18 disciplinary actions with 15 of those, nothing ever happened. That's right. You know, so uh, so those kinds of things need to be thought out, brought out, and made public uh, to uh, the American citizens. Uh, number three, uh, create a policy whereby police officers who discharge their weapon and or use excessive force on an unarmed person be suspended without pay pending further investigation. Uh, make their names, policing history, and additional information outlined in the Freedom of Information Act available to the public upon the disposition of the investigation in a reasonable amount of time. You know, why should we pay somebody mm -hmm. know that the officer has done something wrong, or we feel that they have done something wrong, why should they be paid to take a vacation? You know, suspend them without pay. If that were me on my job, and I was under investigation. That's correct. Give me uh, uh, sit, sitting outside for three months, four months, and paying me. They're going to tell me to exhaust my vacation time. That's right. Get paid. That's and right. Vacation is complete. So let's be fair between civilian and law enforcement. That's what we're saying. Uh, number four, uh, ensure transparency, accountability, and safety of our communities by requiring front facing cameras to be actively recording. For all on duty police officers. So we're basically we're talking about body cams. Mm -hmm. Also, ensure at least two cruiser cameras are utilized in every police car, one facing towards the street and the other facing towards the person in custody. Uh, this bullet point number four actually came about because of an incident that we had right here in Dayton, Ohio, where a young man, aspiring singer, aspiring, mm -hmm. knew him. Uh, his name was Colin English. Yes. Uh, being transported, you know, from a hospital to the jail. And because there was no camera facing to the back, you really don't know what, what happened. Place. You don't know what so, happened. So all we know is we got to take the officer's word. And the officer said that he was handcuffed. He was not seatbelted in, which is a violation. Number one. But, in, but he was not seatbelted. Uh, his hands was cuffed behind his back, and it was stated that he allegedly broke the window out somehow and wiggled out the window and ran mm -hmm. the bridge to his death. Well, how many people are going to believe that? People when believe I that read today, that, that, that happened. When I read that, I thought to myself, you couldn't even write this in a screenplay and it would fly. There right. is something very wrong here. And the investigation process, it wasn't good. That's And that's as kind as I can say it mm -hmm. without being offensive. It wasn't good because just the simple facts of what was stated just don't make sense. Not any way, not anyhow. They don't make sense unless he's Harry Houdini and he was not. I am right. not buying it. I'm not buying it. Right. See, and that's how a lot of citizens feel. Now, have I seen cameras? Because my father was a law enforcement officer as well. So I've seen video footage uh, where, where that has happened. But however, 
you had with some small petite women that I've seen. Mm-hmm. Uh, this young man was kind of built, uh, you know, had a nice body, uh, you know, mm-hmm. his body to be able, you know, and then to look at, uh, you know, the autopsy report, you know, it just things just weren't adding up for, for me. Exactly. exactly. Never know, nobody ever know because there was no footage of what was going on. So, so we need to correct that. We need to make certain, certain there's always footage towards the back. Number five, include in the core training of law enforcement officers an emphasis on mental health assessments mm. in conflicts and improving community relations. So uh, we need to know what is the mental state of our officers that are on the street? That's good. That's you know, good. So, so, uh, so do a mental health assessment and you know, just to make certain that their mental state of mind of course. Uh, you know, you know, is, you know, is in the capacity that they can make good sound judgment when dealing uh, with the American citizen, the average person on the street. Well, and let's let's pause right there for a second. Um, mm-hmm. A job of a police officer is extremely stressful. It is right. dangerous. It causes, I'm sure, all kinds of anxiety. Mm-hmm. There are a lot of things. PTSD is prone to develop in officers based on what they've seen, based on what they've experienced. And when you're asking for those mental health evaluations, at what intervals are they given these evaluations? Because you may be fine your first three months on the job, you go through a really, really bad six or seven months. And then in the 10th, 11th month, you are walking time bomb. You don't know what has happened or transpired in his personal life. What is the interval of these mental health assessments and who conducts them? Not only that, who gets the results of the findings where they can say, we may need to readjust this workload. We may need to adjust your duty schedule based on what is going on. Um, I, I give you the analogy. I spoke to Marvin Lewis when he was coaching the Bengals. And I said, here's the thing. You provide the best trainers for every aspect of those boys' bodies. You provide the the best dietitians to make sure that they are eating the right food with the right supplements. You provide everything to offer the the most comfort in those locker rooms. But how are you taking care of their minds? Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, how are they taking care of the officers' minds? Because right. again, you put a ticking time bomb in a car with a gun and a taser. Mm-hmm. You don't know what his breaking point is. That's right. And when you think about it, police officers are the only people in the world that have a right to kill. That's their right. They can kill you. So we need to make certain that they're using sound judgment. And and let's let's pause with, with that real quick. When yep. you say they have a right to kill you, yeah, they do. The thing that challenges me, and I spoke on this on another platform earlier today, there are certain things or certain jobs you should not have if right. you are not ready to do those jobs. That's right. Example: If I am afraid of public speaking. And I'm anxious. I have all kinds of things happen to me when I'm trying to do. I shouldn't be on the radio. I shouldn't have a a public platform in which I do that every day. So if you are easily frightened, if you are easily made anxious by people of a different race that look different than you, that are built different than you, that seem scary to you, you don't need to be a police officer. If That's you right. cannot channel that emotion and channel that fear in order to do your job, that's not the job for you. I'm I'm not a snake handler because I'm afraid of snakes. That just right. makes sense. <laughs> I'm not a police officer because I am a scary cat. I am right. a chicken. I will I would have been written up every day because I would have I would take my aim and hey consequences later. That's why I don't do that job. I can't right. handle that emotion that way. Right. But what are the checks and balances to make sure the people that do have that job are doing it properly and are mentally maintained? You're absolutely right. You are covering some major points here that I'm so grateful that you guys have come up with. Go ahead, continue. And and uh, and, and I just want to make it, well, when I get down towards the end, and I'll let you know because it's not, well, now, now I'll put a pin in it for a second. This is not just the NAACP. Mm-hmm. 
Oh, yes, the group. Tell us about there, 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 are, there are over there are 21 strategic partners that are aligned with the NAACP that came up with this eight point strategy. I will name those organizations as they get through these eight points. Okay. So you know those. You know we 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 were on a call for probably about a good three and a half hours. Yes. We're actually, taking words out, putting words in. You know, basically do a lot mm-hmm. of nothing and and I, a lot of thought went behind these eight strategic points. And um, and we have and and we got some great partners. So um, so we are, we really appreciate their input and their insight and the wisdom. Uh, that they exemplified during our discussions. That's important. That is very important. Uh, number six, and the and this bullet point is basically in honor of and out of respect of two two men. Uh, one being George Floyd, and the other being Eric Garner. And it is ban the use of knee holds and choke holds as an acceptable practice for police officers. There's no way in the world that two African-American men, one, we didn't see it so much, but when we seen George Floyd die, you know, the first person, Eric Garner, said he couldn't breathe. He couldn't breathe, he couldn't breathe. But when the world saw George yeah. Floyd do the same thing, and then cried out for his deceased mother. Yes. And we watched him die on television. Expire right on television. That right there sent shockwaves throughout this world. Absolutely. And if every law enforcement ag- agency cannot adopt that, they have some real serious issues within the department. Absolutely. That. Number seven. Uh, actively vet all applicants and recruit officers that are reflective in a proportionate representation of the community they serve. Uh, psychological evaluations mm-hmm. shall be used in the hiring of police officers. It goes back to bullet point number number uh, number five. Yes, yes. Uh, the number of applicants for available positions should be hired uh, with regard to diversity and inclusion. If you have a 41 percent uh african-american community you should have at least 41 percent of the officers uh, mm-hmm. are uh, on your police force uh, i can tell you years ago um we probably get up we were probably like 38 percent you know this is probably back in like the 80s 90s somewhere along right right, right. Uh, but but here today we're 41 percent african-american but only about three or four percent with uh, law enforcement officers that are african-americans doesn't make no sense. It doesn't. It, time, it, it, they it try to blame it on saying that African Americans don't want the job. No, that's not necessarily true. Uh, two things I know that can change and get those numbers up real quick. Number one is um, the transfers. Okay. Policy is that if if I'm one, you know, if I want to move my family from uh, from Atlanta to here, and I'm a police officer, uh, you know, then I want to go through the academy training all over again. Why should, if I've been on the force 21 years, why should I have to go through, all I want to do is have a lateral transfer, come to your police department because we're relocating. Why should I have to go through academy training all over again? That's, you know, that's to me, that's a barrier. You know? That's definitely a deterrent for yes. someone that would want to move into our area. Yes. And then I think another piece to that as well is what is the active recruiting process for the African American community, females or people of color? Period. What is that recruiting process? I can even tell you the uh, Dayton police came and did a recruitment campaign on the air here mm-hmm. at WROU. Mm-hmm. And I'm, I'm I'm pausing because I want to be honest. That was around 2016, 2017 okay. even. But, mm-hmm. but the reason I say that is because you haven't been back since. 
Right. And every year you have an opportunity to build relationships with young people, build relationships with these high school counselors that could then allow you to get in front of these young people at their job resource service um, events. Mm -hmm. um, there are possibilities and in how you can recruit minorities um, in including women and men of color that could police our communities. But I know for us being an urban station, Mm -hmm. that has not been what has been done with us. And we're always open to partnerships that would allow us to support in, an, in, a, in a way that the African-American community can be represented. Absolutely, we are open to that. That has not happened in the last three years. It has not. And maybe during our conversations, uh, you know, you know, over these next few weeks and few months, uh, you know, we're trying to Help the police departments implement this throughout Montgomery County. These steps through Montgomery County, uh, I, I will definitely bring that up. Uh, you know, because I, I think that's important. And Absolutely, African American community uh, right now, turn it on WROU. You, you know, th th they're listening. You know, and and they, you have a captive audience. Yes, who may and want we're to willing to share that there. platform in an effort to help them do a better job. Right. So see, a lot of times they say, well, we don't have the resources, uh, the financial resources, but we find resources for what? We find resources for the shot spotter. Yes, sir. Resources for, for the uh, license plate readers. Well, find resources for recruitment. That's right. To me, as simple as that, find resources uh, for recruitment. They did have a young man who became an internet sensation. I think his name was Officer Rick Rayford, I think was his name. Okay. Uh, you know, he was on, um, uh, you know, all over the news and all over Facebook, you know, dancing. He was a young African-American guy. Sure, sure. I believe that he was one of the recruiters, but uh, but he's no longer a recruiter anymore. Uh, but I believe they ought to put him back as a recruiter because he connected with the community. Absolutely. If he didn't connect with the community, he would have became an Internet sensation by doing a little dance and stuff like that. that he Agreed. Was, Agreed. Uh, all over the news. And, and so you need that kind of person that can connect. With the yes. And if they so, can't uh, find you know, resources, the easiest thing they could ever do is solicit a partnership. Because right. that means whoever's partnering with you is going to be vested in what you're doing because it's going to mean something to the community. And that's, that's right. what it's about for us. We're the community station. So with that being said, we would welcome a partnership like that because we want the African-American community to be recruited, to have a better shot at understanding what the deadlines are and being able to apply and be actively recruited, then vetted, to be a part of the Dayton police force. But if you don't solicit a partnership with us, it's unlikely we're gonna call the police department and say, hey, wondering what your marketing is looking like this year, we mm -hmm. wanna help you. Right. That's not how it works in this business, but you solicit a partnership with us and better believe we're invested. We will be invested in that relationship as right. it pertains to this matter specifically. We are mm -hmm. supporting that. Absolutely. And uh, you know, another part of the hiring process uh, that, that I think would be helpful, uh, you know, uh, and all police departments are different. And this is something we, we're going to find out, you know, through this process of meeting with each one of the police chiefs personally and, uh, you know, and the city managers and mayors personally. But one of the things that they can look at, like, like more, specific, more specifically in the city of Dayton, I know that we're on the rule of one, which means that, when you take the test, the civil service test, whoever has the highest score uh, gets the job. And uh, and I think that went into effect some years ago, probably 30 years ago, uh, when when the police department were not hiring minorities and things like that. So it said, well, who would get the highest score? And I, and I think this was put into place under uh, under a ruling by uh, Judge Rice, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, you know, so, so I think that's a rule that we need to revisit. Absolutely. Absolutely. What happens is that, quite frankly, there's a lot of nepotism throughout all police agencies in your the country. Wow. Uh, I, you know, there's a lot of uh, sisters and brothers, aunts and uncles, you know, whatever it is, brothers and sisters. You know, so uh, those individuals, when you have a lot of family members already inside of your department, uh, they're, you know, and you bring it in more, they're going to know how to take the test. They're going to know what the answers are. Uh, you know, and even if they don't know all the answers, you're going to be able to educate them on how to answer the questions. That's uh, right. 
already in there. You know, you went through it yourself. Your, That's right. your father went through it. So if, if you had an African American, uh, you know, uh, you know, or Hispanic or Asian or, or you know, whatever the case may be. First time applicant. Yeah. And and uh, and they may not know what to expect. They may be nervous. So yeah. so let's just say that I score uh, a 92, which is still an A in anybody's book all day. But but the uh, you might my, my counterpart scores a 93 and the rule of one the person who got the 93 is going to be the person who gets the job. Wow. Uh, is is taking a test the only thing that should qualify you to be a police officer? Uh, I know, think there should be way more to it. Right. Way right. More uh, you know, you know, just like when you go and interview, you know, interview for a job, they're they're looking at uh, your look at your demeanor, looking at how mm -hmm. you them. I mean, you know, they're sizing you up anytime you're going for a job. Yes. They're yes. Up, uh, maybe by one, two, or three, or, or a group of people. That's uh, correct. Looking at a whole bunch of things except for a test. So uh, I think that's something that we need need to revisit. Uh, to see what's going to be the most fairest way uh, that you can open it, open it up. Yeah. Uh, we give the police chief some autonomy. Let's say that everybody who scores a 90 to a hundred percent, they're, they're all together. Now let the chief of police or the city manager in conjunction with the city manager, uh -huh. um, uh, you know, interview these people and then make a recommendation. Now you have somebody, now you have somebody to hold accountable. In That's the, right. Of the uh, complexion of your department. That's right. That, not only the complexion, not only the complexion. Right now you have nobody. Do. Yeah. Right. right now you have nobody to hold accountable because everything is done by the test. Yeah, that's a great point. Hold that's account. a very good point. Absolutely. So, uh, and then number eight says uh, provide video footage of all shootings and arrests resulting in loss of life. Uh, as well as alleged police brutality in a reasonable amount of time. So, uh, so just like you know the John Crawford case, uh, you know it took a little while for them to release the tape. They had the tape, of course, of course. You know, so, but it took them a long time and kept the community on edge. Sure, you have you have a lot of people protesting. Tensions uh, high. Yeah, yeah, and. When you could have just released the tape, let people see it, let people form their opinions, then you still conduct your investigation and you still conclude with whatever your investigation is going to uh, conclude with. But how, however, release the tape. Yeah. You know, and uh, don't allow people just to continue to wonder because now you're letting it fester. You let yes. yes. people. And, and, you're, uh, and, uh, that, you know, and then that way you're going to have outrage. Well, and then the distrust begins to mount and it gets right. even because the first thing I do, I, I do this with my children. I do this with anybody. Let me mm -hmm. see it. Whatever it is that you're telling me happened. Let me see it. Well, mm -hmm. hold on. Well, wait a minute. What are you trying to hide? That's the first question I want to know. And That's if right. you do a whole community like that right. over and over again, over again. It breeds distrust in your office. And That's when right. you have that distrust, it's going to be a hard road to hoe to get them back on a place where there's even footing, a level of trust, a level of in any way finding respect for what you do, how you're doing it in their community. Because you've done too much for too long that yep. absolutely does not wash. It just doesn't wash. So getting to that point with your organizations, submitting these and then holding them accountable to work towards a resolution will definitely move our community forward from here. Because at this point, we are at that place. We're at the edge right now where we can either go forward and we're mm -hmm. going to go forward with some great policies and procedures in place, legislation being written, moving ourselves to the polls to be able to execute what we've planned. Right. But if we don't get the buy in, if you will, from right. the government association, the government agencies that we are proposing this to, we're going to have a, a another situation on our hands and it won't exactly. be long. It will exactly. not be long. And 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 I, my prayer is that since the world has now gotten involved and gotten engaged, 
uh, that it will bring. I'm gonna be very optimistic. Yeah, yeah. The world is involved. Yes. Not, not a township, not a city, not a county. Uh, uh, you know, not a state. Mm-hmm. The, not these United States of America, but the entire world. The world is watching. Is watching. Yeah. So, so my hope, and I'm very going to be optimistic that we're going to see some some criminal justice reform that's going to come out of this. And if we don't, if we don't, we're probably bracing ourselves for World War Three or Civil War or, yeah. or or whatever the case may be. Yeah, and so, and we've we've only seen the tip of the iceberg, honestly. Right. Uh, George Floyd was not the first. Right. He was one. He's one of many. He's one of several that were caught on camera being mm -hmm. murdered. What about the families that have buried sons, that have buried daughters, that have been murdered in police custody or in the hands of officers? And we don't even know their names because mm -hmm. in their smaller principalities, municipalities, they are going on what the police told them. Or they're in such a situation where it got no media coverage, nothing has been done, and they're having to live their lives in this pain. What we don't want, and this is what we've just seen over the last 14 days, mm -hmm. we are almost at a calming place where the listening can begin. Yes. The listening can start. And we've mm -hmm. come up with some great things across this platform, some great ideas and some great initiatives to move the conversation forward now that people are ready to sit, exhale, and listen. The problem will become when you listen, you heard us, and you did nothing. Right. This generation right. is not going away empty-handed. They are right. not going, and they're not going quietly. And That's it right. is up to us to make sure that we manage it appropriately. And I love the eight-point strategies because that's what it's about. We can march, we can protest, we can sing, we can cry. But unless we have a plan to move the emotions into movement. That's right. Into action. Into action. Into action. So give us the names of the organizations that worked with you uh, with the NAACP on drafting those. So we're concluding this by saying on behalf of our communities, we demand to work in partnership uh, to develop tools, resources, training, policy, and strategic communication. Uh, the, the desired outcome uh, is to advance racial equity and justice mm. within each one of these respective police departments in Montgomery County, Ohio, to include the sheriff's department uh, and organizations who signed off on this, this eight point strategy mm -hmm. drafted, is the Dayton unit, the Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated, Beta, Ega, Eta, Omega chapter, the Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated, Tau Lambda Omega chapter, Noble, which stands for the National Organization of Black Law Enforcement Executives, Sigma Gamma Rho Sorority Incorporated, Dayton Chapter of the Lynx Incorporated, NID Housing, Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated, the Montgomery County Dayton Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated, Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity, the National Newspapers Publishers Association, the Kappa Alpha Psi Fraternity Incorporated, NABJA, which stands for the National Association for Blacks and Criminal Justice, Zeta Phi Beta Sorority Incorporated, the National Panhellenic Council of Montgomery County, uh, NARAB, which stands for the National Association of Real Estate Brokers, the Most Worshipful Prince Hall Grand Lodge of Ohio, National Council of Negro Women Incorporated, Top Ladies of Distinction, the West Dayton Caravan of Churches Incorporated, the Clergy Community Coalition, and the Northwest Priority Board. All of these organizations signed mm -hmm. off on this eight point strategy. So this is not just the NAACP, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah, yeah. 
and probably an organization that you are a part of. Absolutely. And what I love about the list, these are college educated individuals who understand what it was to be black as a kid, what it mm. was to be black during their college, as well as into their work experience and in their everyday life. The reason I say it like that is because sometimes we have people on boards making decisions for us and about us, but don't really understand us. That's right. Therein lies the rub. That's why things don't always speak to us as a culture and as a community, because there are individuals putting policies and procedures in place that don't favor us because you have no idea how to speak to us, how right. to reach us, how to embrace us as a community. Therefore, we are seeing what we're seeing today. That's but I'm, right. I'm grateful for us to be able to have the conversations that we're having and have had all day on this platform, because what happens so much in the past, somebody would get killed, hurt, and we have rallies, but the conversation really didn't go a lot further after that. That's correct. That's plans, correct. Strategic plans were not developed after that, other than a, we're watching you it's going to take more than that. We want to be a part of your board. We want to yeah. be a part of you developing procedures based on our community. So if we cannot come to the table and speak on behalf of our community, you're really not vested. You're really not vested in making the change. But I feel so good and so energized by the work that your organizations have come together and done, the way it was presented, and how we have come to a place where not only are people talking, we're now at the point where the listening has to begin. It has That's to right. begin. And uh, y'all don't leave uh, your listeners uh, with this. And, and that is, uh, well, a couple of things. We have everyday citizens uh, that go to the polls and can exercise their right to vote on legislation. Uh, we have mayors and council people and, and uh, trustees that can vote on legislation, pass laws within their local jurisdictions. Uh, we have state senators and state representatives that can pass legislation at the state level that affects everyone in the state. We have members of Congress uh, that uh, can pass federal legislation that affects everybody within the United States. Uh, we have the president, the office of president of the United States that can veto legislation. Uh, but there's one thing you can't legislate, and that's the heart of man. Wow. And or woman. You can't legislate the heart. So that's why we got to be able to weed out when we know. As a matter of fact, I just had this conversation with uh, the mayors and managers. If we know who the bad and you and the basically the law enforcement agencies across this nation know who their bad actors are. Yeah. And they need to take swift and decisive action. Mm -hmm. Get those individuals off the force because what we know that they're going to be on the force because of two words. A lot of people know the words weed out the bad seed in the good called. Oh, wow. seed. Yeah. Yeah. But, I want to introduce your audience to a third word. Okay. And that's called breed. If you can weed out the bad. You can seed in the good. But when you have people who are totally bigoted, they yeah. continue to breed the new pups coming up. That is correct. One of, one of my first cases as president of the NAACP here in Dayton, Ohio, one of my highest, biggest profile cases early on was there was a lady, African-American lady named Sandra Ballard out in, she lived in Drexel, Jefferson Township area. And she lived next door to some white supremacist people. They would always call her and her family members, you know, the N-word. Mm -hmm. And so eventually, eventually after over a period of time, uh, you know, the gentleman, the older gentleman, uh, was finally arrested for ethnic intimidation. 
Wow. And while he was in jail, while he was in court, he had already been taken to jail, he was in court. He told through the media that he's going to burn his neighbor's house down. Wow. Burn your house down. Well, she's probably wondering where how, how is he going to burn my house down and he locked up? He's incarcerated right now. Well, that's where the breed comes in at. Yeah. His 16-year-old son set her house ablaze because he was breeding that hate. To be a racist. And to be yeah. Bigoted and to have her hatred in his heart just for a merely color of his skin. But I want to say to make this last statement, and I want you to answer for your audience here today. Okay. To this latest incident. What's his name? George Floyd. I say, what's his name? George Floyd. We're going to continue to keep him, his family, or his family, and all other victims who have been murdered right. at the hands of law enforcement, to include our our, our brother here, John Crawford's family. Yes. Family. Uh, Dante Martin's family. Yes. Dante Price's family. We want to continue to keep all these people uh, uplifting in our prayers. Thank you very much, uh, Faith, for having this discussion. My pleasure. My Thank pleasure. You, uh, bringing me on today. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, it, it's, been, it's been a heavy week. It's been a heavy discussion. But again, so many things have happened and we cry and march and congregate for a while and no changes are made. So that's why this day of discussion had to happen in an effort to open our airwaves and our platforms to allow our listeners to understand it's an uncomfortable conversation, but it's one that has to happen. And yes. we applaud the individuals who have been a part of this with us and who have opened their minds and their resources to share with us individuals from all over. And it was important for us to have Dayton represented in this day of discussion. I thank you, Dr. Fo Dr. Uh, Forward, and I appreciate you spending the time with us today. Thank you, Miss Faith. My pleasure. Thank you for checking out 92.1 WROU. We have more national programming that is going to continue with um, Nick and uh, several guests from all over the nation that are joining this conversation today. It's 92.1 WROU.